Before we start, let's bow our heads again in prayer. Father in heaven, this doesn't work without you. We're here to, to listen to you. Not the words of this broken person, of this sinner. But we're here to, to listen to you and your words, your truth, your love. And so, Father, we ask you, we plead that your presence would be here, that you would come because you promised. You promised. Lord, we're unworthy, we're sinners, but we're here on your day in your house. And Lord, we, we would like to go away with something that will go with us throughout the week, that would go with us through our day and come home with us at night, that we would be changed by your word, by your love, by your sacrifice for us is our prayer. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. I would invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its savor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Many of you know that this is part of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. One notable commentator calls this heaven's benediction to the world. Now, when I see the word benediction, that doesn't sit well with me. I had to look it up. I'm a little embarrassed to say. I always ascribe benediction to a closing. But, but when, you look at, when you look it up, bene, bene means good, and diction means to, to speak, to speak good. Benediction is a blessing. This sermon that Christ gave was a blessing. Christ's greeting to the world, to the people. And this morning I'd like to, to focus on the first part of these three verses. I, I originally had thought that the scripture would just be verse 13, but you really can't read 13 without 14, 15, and 16. But I'd like to focus on this notion of salt. Salt, today we use principally as a flavor Enhancer, right? right? It gives flavor to otherwise bland food. It tur tur turns ordinary or boring into good. And interestingly, it is present in this world that was created for us in vast quantities. The ocean is full of salt. And that's one of the ways that, that salt is harvested. It's also found in mines. There are many cities that are known for their salt. One of the more prominent ones is in Austria, named Salzburg, city on a hill, has salt mines. And salt has been important throughout the history of the world. There's 200, I, I looked this up, I didn't, I didn't know this information, but there's 200, approximately 200 million tons of salt 
that's produced each year, only 6% of which is used by humans. The rest is used for things like making plastics. Uh, paper pulp is made from salt, obviously de-icing roads. Salt is important. In fact, the word salary, how, what we receive for our vocation, comes from the word salt. The word salad goes, dates back to an old Roman tradition of salting their greens. Wars were fought, fought over salt. It was considered precious and, and necessary. When uh, Napoleon was retreating from Russia, because of the cold, his soldiers by the thousands died because they didn't have enough salt. History tells us. Fertilizers use salt as an essential ingredient. Sodium chloride in salt, if exposed to moisture, it disappears and it leaves a white powdery substance that's good for nothing, has no more saltiness. But today, we're talking about salt as it was understood in the time of Christ and for many hundreds of years since then, salt was used as a preserver. It was a preserving agent for meat. They didn't have refrigerators, obviously, back then. And so they salted their fish, they salted their meat, and the salt would dry the meat, the fish, and it would kill the bacteria. And it prevented it from rotting. Salt is also mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, you may recall when Lot and his family was fleeing from Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot's wife turned around, and what happened? She was turned into a pillar of salt. Even Job, which is said to be the oldest uh, account in the Bible, talks about salt as a flavoring for food. So when Jesus was looking out to the crowd, to his disciples and the crowd that was surrounding him, the, f the people knew what he was talking about when he talked about salt. There was, a clear, there was a clear point of reference. Jesus was saying to everyone, you are salt, you are like salt. You are, a, you are to be preservers, preserving agents. You shouldn't be living next to your neighbor and not know them, not mixing with them. I don't want you to be separate and aloof. I want you to preserve them. I want you to be light, because when you're light, you're glorifying me. But salt doesn't have any function by itself when it's sitting in a bag in your cupboard. It's not acting as salt. Salt, in order to be used, has to be mingled with the substance. It must penetrate and infuse in order to preserve. We're also told in Jesus' solemn warning that salt can be useless when it loses its savor or its flavor it's good for nothing, he said, but to be trampled and thrown out. And so I would ask you, as a lay person, and I'm a lay person, I'm not a pastor. I get up every morning and slog to work, like many of you. When I read this, this sentence about me being salt, I have to ask the question, am I, am I salt? How do I consider this in the application to me as a Christian? 
when I meet with colleagues at work, when I run into someone on the street, at the coffee shop, when I'm driving? Am I acting as a preserving agent? A light for the glory of God. It begs the question, doesn't it? How are you known at work? Are you known for your good works? Are you known for your wit, for being gentle, for being cruel? Are you the weird vegetarian that doesn't talk to anyone? Do you not go to happy hours? Do you drink tea instead of coffee or just water? Did I miss anyone? <laughs> Are you salt? What's the mark that you would leave behind if you didn't go to work on Monday? What would they say about you? Can you answer that? This morning, I'd like to look at a short story in the Bible because the Bible is consistent. It repeats. And I want to look at an example of someone, someone we would never guess could be used as salt. Turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. This is a story of Jesus and his disciples. What appears to be a chance encounter on the beach in a country of the Gadarenes. Luke chapter 8, verse 26. This is fascinating, and I just want to say... You know, we have these three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and, and when you're reading stories in the Bible, it is fascinating to compare the different versions in each of the books. What's, what's also very interesting, if, if you look for context here, and you go back to verse 25 and 24, Jesus has just calmed the storm. He was in a boat with his disciples. He fell asleep. You know the story. There were other boats, Spirit of Prophecy says, and in that storm they were pressed together and they were sinking. And the disciples cry out to Jesus. He wakes up without fear and he lifts up his hand and he calms the storm. This is where they're coming from when the storm is calmed And the story leads us to the disciples and Jesus landing on a deserted beach when they're confronted by a demon-possessed man. In Matthew, it talks about two men. And we know this isn't a Jewish community. You can tell, you could have told by the animals that were maybe grazing in the fields. They weren't white sheep. They had a pink hue. These people were pig farmers. And when Jesus stepped out of the boat, he was met by this man, and the desire of ages says that the disciples ran. They had just been with him in a life-threatening situation. And these demon-possessed men run up and they take off. But Jesus does not. This men or these men are naked. They don't live in homes. They live in, among the tombs. They live in the graveyard. And they're fierce. No one passes that way because they're afraid of them. They can't be bound with chains. They're exceedingly fierce. And this, these men run to Jesus. But when they open their mouths, 
the Bible says that his demons spoke with a loud voice saying, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. Then you know the story. These demons begged that they be allowed to go into the pigs, a herd of pigs that were grazing on the mountain nearby. They must have been able to see them. And the book of Mark tells us how big this group of pigs were, this herd. It wasn't a, it wasn't a herd of 100. It was a herd of 2,000 pigs. It's a lot of pigs. Jesus asked the name of the demons, and, and they answered, my name is Legion. How many is a legion? A Roman legion. Anyone, anyone guess? I heard a thousand. Six thousand is, is correct. Six thousand. Not sure that was a literal number, but it was a lot of demons that were in these two men. And Jesus allowed the demons, to, he permitted the demons to enter into the pigs. And when they entered, the herd ran violently down the hill, could not check themselves and run into the water and drown. Luke 8.35 says the keepers fled to the city to recount what happened. But the demon-possessed man was found sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And when the townspeople come out to see this, they see the man. He's now not demon-possessed. They see the pigs floating in the water, 2,000. And they hear the story. They didn't only hear about what happened to the, these menaces, but they also heard the story about Jesus calming the storm. And the Bible says that they were scared. They were afraid because they lost all their pigs. Apparently, not only did they eat these pigs, they used them for sacrifice. Again, this was a pagan, the, the area of Decapolis was a pagan area of 10 cities. And it says the people begged him to depart. And, and I don't want you to miss this. Please look at, uh, actually, I would invite you to turn now to Mark, to, to the version of this story in Mark chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. And when he went into the boat, it says, he who had been demon-possessed begged that he might be with Jesus. However, Jesus didn't permit him, but said to him, and this is verse 19, don't, don't miss this. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion for you. And he departed. This is the man who was demon-possessed. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him. And listen. Listen. And all marveled. That's important. He departed to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. I'd invite you to pause for a minute to think about this. Jesus has just exercised these demons from this man, but he doesn't permit he doesn't permit him to stay with him. He sends him on a, on a, he gives him a job. 
He makes him a missionary. I want you to be a preserver. I want you to be light. Despite the fact that you've only known me for a few hours, I want you to tell your friends, others, what the Lord has done for you. Not one servant, the, this demoniac, hadn't listened to one sermon from Jesus. He hadn't been like the disciples to have spent time with him. They weren't, he, they weren't instructed by Christ, but they bore on their person the evidence that they were with the Messiah. They had been healed. They could tell what they knew they could tell what they saw, they could tell what they felt, what they experienced. When I, when I read this, my initial impression is that Jesus is being, this sounds bad and forgive me, but Jesus, it sounds like he's being a little mean. If this were me, if I had been a terror to the countryside, and I had just been made clean. I would have come up with a hundred excuses. I can't, I can't go and do that. You just got here. I just got here. I need more time with you. I want to hear your sermons. I want to see you heal. I've been an embarrassment my whole life and you want me to go home? I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Maybe you've been with me two hours and you're sending me away. But I, I tell you, and, and this is what's fascinating, later in the book of Mark, chapter seven and eight, it mentions that Jesus returned through the area of Decapolis. And you know what it says? The multitude was very great. These former demoniacs had been planting seeds. And these seeds had fallen on fertile soil. We don't know if, if uh, for a fact, but I'm convinced that these two men went home and they told everyone everything they knew. So that when Jesus came through again, they were ready. The people were ready to hear him. So what of you and me, comfortable Christian? Does this story make it home? I don't, I don't know your upbringing, but I, I can tell you, I, I grew up in the church. I guess I'm fortunate in that sense. I went to church school for part of my life. I was baptized when I was 13 years old. It was my decision. I had a lot of time in and around this. Isn't there a problem? Isn't there a catch? Can you give something that you don't have? Do you have something to give to others? Do you have a message for your friends, for your colleagues, about what great things the Lord has done for you? And would, would people marvel? Do you have a testimony? Yes. 
it makes me think of the parable of the ten virgin, virgins. You know that you know that story, right? Ten virgins. They all had lamps, which we today think of the Bible. They were all Christians. But five had oil and five didn't. Five had the Holy Spirit and five did not. And the five that didn't were shut out. Which group, which group would you be in today? Do people know that you're a Christian at work? Do you pray for your colleagues? Are you just as uptight and patient and short-tempered as the next? I worry, I worry when I read this story that the truth is that we're not ready to be salt because we have nothing remarkable to share. The preserving agent is missing. Maybe we're just white powder that has no savor, which Christ says is good for nothing. The book Desire of Ages says, page 347, our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. Our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. And that which is most effective is the testimony of our own experience. Do you understand what that means? We need to have a testimony. There's a little book entitled Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. Look, I have it. It's pocket sized. It fits in your back pocket. You can take it with you into the bathroom and you can pull it out instead of your phone when you're in there. It's this big. It still has, a, it's, this is old. I have the, the price tag is on there, $2.49. This book is written, the entirety of the book is about the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to I read. I know you're not supposed to do this, but I'm not a pastor, so I can. Read an excerpt from this book. I should have put it up on the screen, but it was too much text. I'm going to read two short paragraphs to you. Without a living faith, this relates to being salt. Without a living faith in Christ as a personal Savior, it is impossible to make your influence felt in a skeptical world. It is in proportion to our own devotion and consecration to Christ that we exert an influence for the blessing and uplifting of mankind. Did you hear that? In proportion to our devotion and our consecration to Christ. By our lack of grace of Christ, By our lack of the grace of Christ, we testify to the world that the truth which we claim to believe has no sanctifying power. And thus, so far far as our influence goes, we make no effect to the word of God unless we have the Holy Spirit in our hearts. When love fills the heart, it will flow out to others not because of favors received from them, but because love is the principle of action. Love modifies the character, governs the impulses, subdues enmity, and ennobles the affections. This love is as broad as the universe. It is this, and only this, that can make us salt of the earth. Amen. 
in closing, I'd like to share an imperfect and unfinished personal testimony. Most of my adult life from my teenage years until about a few years ago, I struggled to have a relationship with God. I, I knew I needed one. And, and as I noted, I went to I went to church school for part of my life, and so I would feel there were times when I felt close, and I would get close when I needed something. And then as times were going good, I kind of strayed away. You know, how do you know the feeling? I drifted. And then I would try to daily read my Bible, and it would start out really good every morning, and I can remember different times from the time when I was probably 18, 19 years old where I would try to study the Bible every morning, but it, I, it just didn't, it didn't stick. I would do it for a while and then I would stop and it was depressing. It's like a diet. I fell off of it, got back on, fell off of it. Until one day, I don't know exactly when, it was probably five or six years ago, I listened to a sermon from the pastor of the Pioneer Memorial Church at Andrews University. And the pastor said, if you want a lasting relationship with God, I challenge you to read the crucifixion story every day, every morning. Less than one chapter. Matthew chapter 27, verses 15 through 54, 39 verses. And he said, there's one, one more thing. Never open the Bible without prayer. And so I started that. 39 verses, how long does that take? It's actually a big chapter. And I can't tell you how it started, but my devotion time, and some of you have heard this story, I apologize if you have already. Then my devotion time started at five minutes, and there were five nervous minutes because I had a very stressful job at the time. I still have that same job, but it's less stressful now. And I would read, and the, these thoughts would, about work would come in, and it was stressful, but I stuck with it. And, and that five minutes time over the period of weeks, and I, and I didn't just read in Matthew, I then went to Mark to read the, the uh, crucifixion story in Mark and then in Luke. It's fascinating how many different pieces of the story you get by reading them separately and then putting them together. The picture is amazing, it's full. I remember during this time, I, w I would get tension headaches. My, my, mouth, my shoulder on my mouse hand would seize up during the day because I was so tense. And so at one point, I shifted my mouse hand to learn how to use my mouse with my other hand because I couldn't have this. I was having so many problems. But as I read, God started working. God. And the time started growing. And I would talk to him, and I would say, Lord. I'm stressed. I have too much to do. And here I'm reading your word, but I'm going to trust you not to miss anything, because I can't. If I miss things, I'm a lawyer, if I miss things, I get into trouble, the court issues orders, and I could lose my license. <clears throat> I have people relying on me besides my family. And I did also one other thing that's important, and I forgot to bring it, but I started journaling. That's important. Not the kind of journal where you write, today I had a vanilla latte. That, that's not that kind of journal. 
I would write down what I was reading, what I thought. I started that journal. My first journal entry was on October 20, 2014. I journaled through the passing of my mother in May of 2016. And I know that everyone is different, but that whole process, reading the crucifixion story, changed my life. And I still experience all the same problems that most of you experience, but my stress has gone away. My, my, my worship time every morning now has grown to over an hour. I don't, I don't when, when, when uh, work thoughts come into my mind, I pull a sheet of paper out, jot it down, push it away. But God is so good. My day is now shorter because I'm reading my Bible, I'm studying, I'm praying, but I still get all my work done. In fact, I have more work now because in this time, our firm has grown. And you can pull my wife and children aside afterwards if you want, and they'll still tell you that he's still a sinner. He still could be better. But hopefully in these stories that they would recount to you, they would tell you that they're stories of faith, they're stories of love, there's testimonies, things that happen. I pray every day that I can be used by God that I can be a blessing, that my eyes would be open to see the needs of others. I pray for my employees, not all of them all the time, because I, I don't know if I have that much time. I probably should. But I pray for them, and it's changing my life. Little by little, God is merciful. He, he is so patient, because I am so slow. And I need to learn something Yesterday, I need to learn it again. But I'm convinced of this. God is working. And so my daily prayer, the prayer I have for you is speak to him. Read the story of Jesus sacrificing himself When I was a kid, I grew up when we would read the Bible story about the Israelites and their plight when they left Egypt. I remember thinking, how can they be so short-sighted? I would, that would never happen to me that I would forget the promises and then do something stupid again and then do something stupid again. And it would take 40 years, but we're just the same way. We're not focusing on heaven. We're focusing on our 401ks. We're focusing on our houses. We're focusing on our kids' education. And that's not bad, but we're supposed to focus on him, on life after death. Don't store up for yourself possessions for personal use, but seek me. Be salt of the earth. We need to be reminded, as Daniel reminded Belshazzar, when the writing was on the wall, the one who holds your breath in his hand the one who owns your ways, you are not glorifying. God has promised, Jesus has promised, those who confess me, I will confess to the Father. I want to confess him because I want him to confess me. My prayer this morning is that we will be salt with savor we will share the great things. We will have great things to share. 
We will ask and we will ask for testimonies. Our eyes will be opened and we will share them with the world so that people will marvel as they did when these, this demoniac who was healed spoke about what Jesus did. And the Holy Spirit will add his blessing and seeds will be planted for the watering by him. Amen. Amen.